Amen. If you got your Bibles, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 24. 1 Samuel chapter 24. I, I did want to make a, a little announcement this morning that I uh, felt sorry for the other preachers because they only get like 30 minutes and I get 40 minutes six times. <laughs> Talk about blessed right there. There you go. Um, it's good to be here this morning. Good to be with y'all. Notice the crowd's down a little bit. I, the only thing I, I can attribute to is conviction, so <laughs> so be it, you know? That's all right. Uh, we've been talking about the crucible this week, and uh, we've been looking at David, and yesterday we looked at David and Goliath. Today, though, we're going to look at David and Saul, and um, there's a couple of stories we're going to look at today, and, and I, hope, I hope this is encouraging to you, but I... There are just, well, let me just get going with it, okay? Um, before David entered the picture, Saul, he got him impatient. Remember that? He, Samuel said, you wait for me. And then Saul said, I, I'm not going to wait anymore. I'll offer it myself. I'll make the, my offerings myself, and I'll take care of everything. I'll do it myself. And uh, when Samuel got there, he had some harsh prophetic words for the king. Look what he said. He said, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord commanded him to be captain over his people because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. Listen, it, you got to understand, I, I believe there's a calling on each person and you got a calling, and, and you got to answer that calling. And that's for you. And, but you got to do what God wants you to do, and not what God wants somebody else to do. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Um, from my own life, uh, when I was called to preach, I, I was convinced that every preacher should be a pastor. And then, I, <laughs> Jim, I figured out that's not how it worked. Because <laughs> I fell miserably on my face when I tried to do that. And God taught me a very valuable lesson. If I haven't called you to do it, don't try to do it on your own. Amen. All you pastors should say amen at that one. I'll guarantee it. Um, Saul lost everything because of a rash decision to fudge on God's instructions. He begged Samuel for a, for a good word. He said, give, give me a prophetic word. And he, was, he, he grabbed a hold of Samuel's cloak and it tore and, and Samuel said, just the same way, God has torn the kingdom from you and your family. So the guy who looked like a great leader didn't have the character for it. We've been talking about character this week. So Saul was told again in chapter 15 he would be replaced. <coughs> chapter 16, Samuel anoints David as the future king. David was promoted honored in the court for a time, but he didn't remain in the king's favor for too long. Uh, Saul tried to get rid of David indirectly by sending him out to battle against the Philistines. Remember that? David succeeded. <laughs> go out there and fight the Philistines. You go do this. And he was trying to set him up to fail, but listen, if you're God's man, you're not going to fail. Amen? Amen. So the, they, they ended up with bitter conflict and jealousy, and Saul pursued David. Now Saul was still the king. God had said that Saul was on his way out, and David's on his way in, and one man received God's judgment, the other one got his blessing. And then a door opens up for David to make a choice. You know, it looks like a setup, and sometimes I believe people see a door opening, and they, they say, hey, Hey, God wants me to do something. You ever heard somebody say that? There's a door opening for me to do something. Be careful when you see that door. Uh, there was a song I heard once said, When God closes a door, look for a window. And when I heard that song and I heard somebody sing it in church, I thought, Do you know what you're saying? You're saying that God doesn't know what he's doing. 
Look for another way out. Listen, you look through windows, you don't walk through windows. Amen? We, we are there, we have windows in our lives so we can see what other people are doing. But just because somebody else is doing it doesn't mean God's called you to do it. Okay? David had an opportunity here to kill Saul and end his exile. Imagine that you're designated by God to be the next king. And Samuel had already told him so. Probably sounded like an imminent trans transition when Samuel anointed you and blessed you to be the next king. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he anoints David, and David's like, I'm going to be the next king. It's great. It's great. I've been anointed. It's going to happen. And then days turn to months. Months turn to years. It seems like it's taken forever. The current king's not deposed, and he didn't die. He's alive, and he's angry that you're more popular than him. So he's trying to kill you. Okay? Now get this picture. In order to escape his reach, you, you hide out in the desert. Uh, you go undercover in enemy territory and pretend like you're insane so they won't kill you. <laughs> Just think about that for a while. All right? You don't stay in one place too long. You prepare yourself for an attack that's imminent, could happen any moment, and then you rely on your wits and on God. Now, we was in Israel, and we went to this old place called En Gedi, and, and uh, Sean had a, a very good word when we were there. He said, you know, until I saw that beautiful waterfall and how nice it looked there, he said, I felt sorry for David, but after I saw that, it's like, you're living in a beautiful place. Uh, David wrote psalms about being surrounded by enemies. And in chapters 24 and 26, Saul found out he was hiding in En Gedi, an oasis near the Dead Sea. So what did Saul do? He took 3,000 of Israel's best soldiers on a manhunt. And if you'll look in uh, chapter 24, uh, 1 Samuel... In verse 2, it says, Saul took 3,000 of his choice men out of all of Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep coats, by the way, where it was a cave. And Saul went in to cover his feet. And David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. So Saul goes in to the cave to go to the bathroom. Now, I know you're looking at me saying, I can't believe you talk about this in church. <laughs> well, it's in the Bible. I ain't making it up. I couldn't make it up this well. So he covers his feet. How does he cover his feet? He takes his robe off. All right? So while he's sitting there in the cave with his robe covering his feet, the guys show up. And he doesn't know that they're in the cave with him. Now... You say, what in the world? They've been staying in the cave too. So David had this, this dilemma. David's men saw this as a, a God-given opportunity. It's a, Lord David, this is an open door. God opened the door for you, buddy. You need to walk through that door and take it. Take, take the kingdom. David Renz reminded him of something God said to him. Apparently, the Lord had spoken to David about a time when he would give David's enemy into his hands. So God made it perfectly clear he was removing the kingdom from Saul, giving it to David. That was his will. Wouldn't you consider this maybe God's plan to make the prophecy take place? Seriously, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you look at it and say, Oh, Lord, you put him right here for me. I can have the kingdom now. And I dare say most Christians, a lot of Christians today would look at that and say, Oh, Lord, you put him right in the place where he needs to be. Now I can take over. Woo! Praise the Lord. Start shouting and stuff. And then they'd get killed because of the king's song. But... Uh, 
If God had arranged the circumstances and I squandered them, wouldn't it be negligence? If an open door is a sure sign of God's will, then this is disqualified for certain. But David's men saw it that way, and, and who could blame them? Listen, Saul wasn't just chasing David. He was chasing them. He had 3,000 men. He wanted to kill David and everybody with him. So imagine you're back in the cave with David. What would you be telling David? Hey, Bill, you're back in the cave with David. Hey, Dave, look, there he is. Let's just kill him now. Let's kill him. Let's just kill him and take over. Understand. Understand what's going on here. So David's men were exiles as much as he was. Saul was completely vulnerable to whatever they wanted to do to him. So look at this. He was completely justified. He could call it self-defense. He had loyal affirmation from his men. The circumstances were perfect. There would never be a better time to defeat Saul. He had a prophecy from God that this day would come. How could this not be a divine opportunity? I know there's many people today looking for a divine opportunity to do something that God doesn't want. I've done it. You probably have too. But you won't stick your hands up, and I understand that. You don't want to be embarrassed. I, I get it. It's a choice between living by the appearances of circumstances versus living by the big picture and grounding himself in truth. David chose to live by a higher principle than the open door in front of him. David was living to a higher standard. All right? And, and listen, I... I I know this isn't, this isn't popular today, and this is not a popular message, and, and I knew it last night when I went to bed because I went through this whole thing and said, Lord, are you sure we want to do this today? Because this ain't one of them shouting things where like, oh, yeah, praise the Lord, you're right. This, this kind of like sticks you in the eye and says, oh, I don't like the way I see it. I don't like the way that sounds. That, that don't feel real good. But let me tell you something. God isn't interested just in the end goal. He's concerned about how we get to where we get and why we do what we do. All right? There's more important things. David's decision. David recognized that Saul was still the king. Uh, he, he pointed that out often, that Saul was the Lord's anointed. Now, God made it clear that he was going to lose his throne, but he was still the anointed of God. Listen, when David received the anointing, then he had a sudden respect for other people that had been anointed as well. And let me tell you something I've learned in my life. This is Scotty speaking, all right? This ain't in my notes. This is just from my perspective. A lot of people get the anointing and then they think they have a right to judge someone else's anointing. That's not your job. My job isn't to judge your anointing. My job is to do my job and keep my mouth shut when it comes to another preacher's anointing. Amen? You preachers ought to shout on that one, but that's okay. Now, it's true that David could also claim the, 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 the anointing, but David's kingship had not been formalized. God had not cleared the way. So any other claim to the throne would look like rebellion. And rebellion is a problem in the world today. Okay? You understand that? The Bible says, back in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And there is 
There are, are so many people today that believe rebellion is a good thing. They enjoy it when their children are rebellious. Because they said, well, that's, that's a fact of growing up. No, that's not a fact of growing up. Huh? That's, it's not right. I, I my children, uh, I, I would catch my, listen, listen, I'm very particular about authority. I, I, I have a, if, if there's any one burr in my life, it's about authority. And my children would say, hey, dad, be careful, the cops are behind you. I said, they're not cops, they're police officers. The word cops came from copper, which they had little of back in the days, and so they started to call them cops because that's what they shot with. Their bullets were copper. And so it became uh, something of disrespect to police officers. And I told my children, we do not disrespect the police officers. You say, you know why? If you disrespect them, your kids will disrespect them. Yeah. I, I, I got pulled over by an officer once because I was trying to merge in, and I pulled in in front of him on the freeway. And he said, you didn't give me enough distance. And he pulled me over. I rolled my window down, and he came up to the car, and he said, you, you cut me off. I said, I was trying to merge, sir. He said, uh, well, you, you did it too close. You're going to get a ticket for this. I said, okay. So I gave him my stuff, and he came back. And I said, thank you. He said, what? I said, thank you. I was in too much of a hurry today, and I cut you off, and that was wrong for me to do so. I'd like to apologize for cutting you off. I'll gladly take the ticket, and I'll pay it. I deserve it. I need to slow down. Thank you, sir. I apologize. He was floored because he'd already wrote out the ticket. He couldn't take it back now. I didn't want him to take it back. You see, listen, I respect him. When I see a person go by that says Vietnam vet on the back of the car, I try to get up next to him and I say, thank you. I'm not going to spit on him. I'm going to say thank you. Why? Because he did something for my country. He fought for us. I thank veterans. I thank the police officer. Listen, rebellion is an open sin against God. And we cannot, cannot expect our church to grow with open rebellion in it. Amen? Can't do that. Very few people in our culture have much respect for authority. We forget that whether we like and agree with our leaders or not, God still ordained them in their role. Romans 13.1 is emphatic that the authorities who exist have been established by God. Authorities are established by God. So when you get pulled over, it's probably because you're speeding and you've broken the law, so thank them. Thank them for enforcing the law. Amen? Praise the Lord. Listen, thank them for enforcing that law, but thank God that Jesus fulfilled the, the, the law, the scripture itself. Now listen, David didn't necessarily have a high view of Saul, but he had a high, extremely high view of God and his will. And he refused to usurp, circumvent, or hasten the plan of God. So David refused to interfere with what God had established. See, his view of Saul wasn't very great, but his view of God was great, and his view of Saul's position was also great. You say, why do you think it was so great? Because someday he's going to be the king. And when he's the king, you know what he wants? He wants the respect that he's given. Amen? Praise the Lord. Saul didn't deserve much respect, but that wasn't the point. It had nothing to do with Saul's character and everything to do 
with God's will. So instead of killing Saul, David crept up and secretly cut off a corner of his robe. Now think about this. He sneaks up and he cuts off the corner of the robe. And he says, hey, and I, I, I know what he's going to do. He's going to say, listen, I, I had the opportunity to kill you, but I didn't. But then after he does it, Bill, you know what? He feels bad about it. I mean, it hurts his conscience that he did something to the king. All right? Now, I know there's plenty of people in churches that wouldn't feel bad about stabbing somebody in the church in the back, namely the pastor. Can I get an amen on that one? Huh? You've known people like that. You've seen them. You've gone to church with them. And they've talked bad about your pastor until you set them straight and say, no, you're not going to talk about my preacher like that. Is that what you've done? Or you just let them talk? I don't want to talk about my preacher. <laughs> no, buddy. Uh, my preacher will fight you, and if he won't, I will. Amen? Listen, listen. He's the man of God. He deserves respect. Your pastor deserves respect. You know that. If you go to this church, you ought to respect and revere your pastor. Hold him up in high regard. Love him, appreciate him, and take care of him and his wife. And I say that because when I was a pastor, although I shouldn't have been a pastor, my wife got treated with a lot of disrespect. And today, that's why I love pastor's wives today. I appreciate them, I respect them, and I tell you, I'll do anything for you, whatever you want. If she asks for something, if she'll, she'll, she'll say, hey, I'd like to get such and such. I said, how many do you want? Well, how much are they? I said, for you, they're free today. I don't care what it is. You tell me what you want, I'll get it for you. Why is that? I respect her as well. You know why? By respecting her, I'm respecting him. If you ever wanted a cardiogram of a man after God's heart, this, this is it. I, I go in and I, I get a cardiogram every six months. I had a, I had a heart issue at one point where the heart would just start beating real fast. I don't know what you call that. It's some fib. I don't know what it is. But I, I know a, a fib is when you tell a lie. So uh, I had this fib thing. And I wasn't telling lies. It just started beating fast. And, and Brother Mike, I tell you, I was in church once on a Sunday morning. And I was a uh, youth leader. And we were shaking hands in the church once. And my heart started into this fib thing where it's beating like 320 beats a minute. And it's like cranking, man. And I'm standing there next to him, and they got the air conditioning running, and I'm in a, I'm in a super sweat. And people are like, are you okay? I said, well, my heart's running a little fast. And they went and they checked my pulse. <laughs> they said, we can't even feel a heartbeat. I said, well, it is. <laughs> it's just fast. Listen, I get a cardiogram every six months. They check out my heart to make sure it's okay. And what they do is they, they get that little thing and it has a picture of what your heart's doing. David's heart was so sensitive, he regretted damaging the king's clothes. That's a man after God's heart. Amen? It's fascinating that David acknowledges that the Lord had delivered thee into mine hand, yet he did not interpret the circumstances as an opportunity for victory. He didn't assume that an open door indicates God's will, even if God is the one that opens it. Well, you say, well, that, that's good. He, he, didn't, he didn't kill the king. Well, that wasn't the only opportunity he had. I want you to notice this next one. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to... 1 Samuel chapter 26. Verse 7, so it says, So David and Abishai came to the people by night, and behold, Saul lay sleeping within the trench. And his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster. But Abner and the people lay 
round about him. Then said Abishai to David, God hath delivered thine enemy into thine hand this day. Now therefore let me smite him. See, the first time they said, David, God's delivered him into your hand. Kill him. But Abishai says, no, 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 I got a better idea. You let me kill him. What's he saying? Don't dirty your hands with this. I'll, I'll take the blame for it. What he says, nah. God hath delivered the enemy in thine hand this day. Let me smite him. I pray that with the spear, even to the earth at once, I will not smite him the second time. He said, listen, I'll kill him so fast and so good, nobody will know it. He won't. There will be no pain. It will be painless. I'll just kill him, and then your problems are over. That's what he's saying, okay? You say, well, how do you know that? You read it several times. You'll see exactly what he's saying. David, you don't have to do it. I'll do it. What did David say? David said, Abishai, destroy him not, for who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said, furthermore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him. Or his day shall come to die, or he shall descend into battle and perish. Lord forbid that I should stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed, but I pray thee, take now the spear that is at his bolster and the cruise of water and let us go. So David took the spear and the cruise of water from Saul's bolster, and they got them away. No man saw it, nor knew it, neither awaked, for they were all asleep. Because a deep sleep from the Lord was fallen upon them. Did you get that last part? Who was the deep sleep from? From the Lord. The Lord had caused them to fall in such a deep sleep that they could walk right up on them at night and stand right over them. You ever had a test in your life that, like, Lord, you've opened this up for me. Thank you, Lord. Now I can finally be free of this. And well, the Lord, he may have opened the door for you, but you don't necessarily need to walk through it. Now, let me get on here. I'm, I'm getting off the track here. Opportunity knocks again. David's hiding out in a different desert. And Saul gets word of where he's at. And David's intentional to search for Saul. But it's clear David's goal is not to kill the king. His men already know that da what David would do. So Abishai doesn't even urge David to kill him. He says, let me do it. I'll, I'll, let me pin him to the ground. You won't have to thrust the spear twice. One strike. Quick, painless, done. David expects to get to the throne according to God's promise. It's in God's hands, not David's. Timing is God's responsibility. I want you to get that. If you don't get nothing else I say today, get this. Timing is not in our hands. It's in God's hands. And God will make things come about when it's his time. You know when we get into trouble, it's when we try to rush things. Huh? You ever notice that? You rush things and say, God, here, let me help with this along a little bit. I'm going to help it along. I'm going to make it work the way I want it to. Man, it'll be great that way. My son, he, he's a nerd like me. He is. He's a big nerd. I mean... Uh, he got his income tax check last year and he bought the parts and built a supercomputer so he could play games with his friends from church. And I said, well, he's at least he's hanging out with church friends. That's good for me. I tried to urge him to go to school to be a, a computer nerd. And he said, no, Dad, I want to be a police officer. I said, well, at least you're calling him a police officer. That feels good to me. And, uh, but I said, I, I don't think you're cut out for that. He'd been playing too much Call of Duty with Sean and that shooting people stuff. And that's, I said, that, 
that's not what being a police officer is all about. There's more to it than that, and nine times out of ten, you're going to get hurt in the field. So keep that in mind. Well, he didn't listen to me so much, but after a while, he kept looking around and trying to do different things, and he wouldn't let, and I, I told him, I said, son, I think you, you'd be good as a computer nerd, my friend. And he didn't listen to me, but his mom took him to the school, and they went to the school and said, hey, look at this. This is really nice. They teach computer stuff. And he went, and he looked at it all, and he said, man, I like this. So now he's going to school to become a computer nerd. He, he didn't listen to me, but he listened to somebody else. But guess what, Cal? It's still the same. My timing wasn't his timing. I said, do it now. This is what you want. This is what you ought to do. No, he's like, no, I don't want to do that. I want to do my own thing. Okay, so he did his own thing for a while. Cost him a lot of money. Now he's doing what he, what's good for him. And he's into it, and he loves it. And he said, Dad, this is the greatest thing I've ever done. I said, praise the Lord. I didn't say anything to him after that. I just said, okay, you do your thing. That's great. I looked at his mom. I said, how'd you do that? It's not my business. You know, our, our two biggest complaints about God's ways is his process and his timing. His process is almost always different than what we expected. And his timing is always slower than we expected. Huh? Isn't it? He, listen, it's always a lot slower than I wanted it to be. When God promised David he would be king, but he didn't say when he would be king. When God gives a promise, he rarely reveals the process. And I dare say, David would not have been able to bear the weight of his destiny if, if he had not spent time learning to depend on God. If God would have told, if Samuel would have, would have anointed him and said, Okay, now, David, after I anoint you, things are going to go good. There's going to be an uptime. Then all of a sudden, the, the king's going to come after you and try to kill you. And he's going to chase you around all over the place. And you're going to live in caves and in the desert. And you're going to be away from your family and friends. And it's going to be awful. And I, I, I can see David, Brian, just saying, <laughs> you out of your mind? Why in the world would I want that? See, God doesn't tell us what's coming. We need to learn to depend on him. Because he is building the qualities into us that we need in order to be what he wants us to be. So David is learning what he needs to be a, a good king. When he needed to make difficult decisions, he had to, uh, to hear God's wisdom and rely on it. So God developed the qualities of a king in that time. You've probably heard the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. That's not true with God because God's not just interested in getting us where he wants us, but getting us there for it. In his mind, the shortest distance between two points is a zigzag. He's going to take you over here. Then he's going to take you over here. Then he'll take you here. Then he might take you somewhere else. But eventually, you'll learn what he wants you to know to do what he wants you to do. Amen? Amen? So what's the lesson from these two stories? Well, we can get all kind of conclusions. But many people under, operate under a basic assumption that an open door is equal to divine guidance. But submitting to circumstances is subjective. Circumstances change. But the word of God never changes. It's very objective. And in the life that we're living today, in the world we're living in, we don't need more subjective. We need more objective. Is an open door an indication of God's will? Well, maybe, but that's, that's not enough. See, you've got to have something to go with it. And, and if the open door does not line up with the will, the revealed will of God, stay away from it. Run from the door. And even if it is open, lock it. 
It's got to line up with what his word says. We got to recognize that when circumstances are pointing in one direction and God's word's pulling us to another way, truth trumps circumstances. All right? Don't let circumstances guide your life. Understand this. God is not the only one who can orchestrate circumstances. Huh? What would you say? Satan can. Satan can allow things to happen, and all of a sudden, we'll start thinking, oh, Lord's leading me here. Look what just happened. You better pay attention. You pay attention. Listen, you listen to the word of God. Listen, you trust the Lord. How can you tell the difference between circumstances God arranged and circumstances you've been set up with? You need something more objective and more lasting than your viewpoint. Amen? Listen, I, I, I speak from experience. I tried to do what I thought God wanted me to do, and I went down the wrong path. And I step back and look at it now and say, Lord, what in the world? And he just like, I feel like, you ever watch that NCIS where Gibbs hits that guy in the back of the head like that all the time. I feel like there was times in my life when God would slap me in the back of the head and I wouldn't listen. But thank God he's got me where he wants me now. Listen, you can make all kinds of mistakes. You can louse things up. You can, you can goof things up real bad. But God can still use you if you just recognize that you made a mistake. And you take it to God and say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I messed this all up. Basing our lives on truth instead of circumstance, it isn't always obvious or easy. It's not always supported by those around us. They may or may not be giving us an accurate picture of God's purposes. But his character always, always does. Base your decisions on what saith the word of God. Don't worry about them open doors. Listen, I've seen doors open and close in the same day. Uh huh. Yeah, doors will open, doors will close, but the truth of the word of God never changes. Father, I thank you, Lord, today for allowing us to be in your house once again this morning, God. David looked at circumstances. Sir, he didn't take circumstances to heart. He based his decisions on the truth of your will and your ways. God, I thank you for that. Lord, I pray you'll help us today, God. To There we go. Tell me to shut up. Praise the Lord. I stopped at the right time. Father, I pray that today, as we, as we continue to look in your word, I pray that you'll bless the preacher of the hour today, God. Help him to preach just what we need to hear. God, help the singers that sing to sing what we need to hear. God, have your way in this service. Bless your people today is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.